All right, we have already seen the basic concepts about wellbore stability, how we apply that to a vertical wellbore and determine what are the wellbore breakout angles and what are the limits for tensile fractures in a wellbore. We then took a look at the determination of the mud window and how to extend all of those concepts to deviated wellbores. Now we're going to talk about other factors that affect wellbore stability. And we're going to start talking about thermal effects. Thermal effects are the effects that are caused by the coupling between temperature and stress. And before we go jump into the wellbore, let me start here with an example. Let's say that we have a, a rock which undergoes a change of temperature and undergoes cooling. And let's imagine to begin with that this particular piece of rock, let me move this down, is, this is the rock and it's going to be glued to two surfaces that do not move. And then we cool this rock and lower the temperature. You may expect that the rock, if it is under free conditions, it will shrink, right? So let me add here the same rock, but with no gluing on the sides, if you lower the, the temperature, then you would expect this rock to shrink, to deform and shrink, shrink because of the thermal dilation coefficient. If you heat it up, it expands. If you cool it, it will shrink. However, if the rock is glued to the sides and it's not allowed to shrink, in horizontal direction, it might just shrink on vertical direction, but instead of shrinking in horizontal direction, what is going to develop is a tensile stress all along the rock. And this tensile stress that develops because the shrinkage is inhibited is very similar what happens into a wellbore when you lower the stress. When you lower the stress around the wellbore, the rock which is on the wall of the wellbore is going to try to shrink in all directions, in radial direction, but also in the tangential direction. And because all the rock is going to shrink or is going to try to shrink at the same time, that's not going to be possible. And instead of a shrinkage, there is going to be a development of a hoop uh, tensile stress. And that uh, hoop tensile stress uh, can have uh, effects which are uh, quite, uh, quite important. For example, if uh, you had uh, values of temperature in the order of uh, 200F, which is more or less uh, 100 degrees C, the additional tensile stress delta sigma theta theta, which is caused by thermal conditions, is going to be given by this equation. And where this is the thermal dilation coefficient, alpha t, and this is a change of temperature. And we were saying that for changes of more or less 100 C, which is about 200 F, these changes of temperature uh, are going to cause changes of the stresses which are in the order of more or less 1,000 PSI. And 1,000 PSI, it's a number which is quite big. I hope that you remember that the tensile strength of, of most rocks, it's uh, below 1,000 PSI. So if you were to develop a tensile stress which is already 1,000 PSI, that would be enough to fracture the rock. So where do we have to take this into account? We have to take this into account when we compute 
uh, drilling induced tensor fractures. Uh, for example, when you use a, a wellbore mud which has a temperature which is lower than the temperature in subsurface conditions, then you're going to have to consider this, uh, this phenomenon. And I hope you remember that that type of of effect is going to be taken into account here when we look at drill induced tensor fracture. So let me click over here. You remember this equation? In this equation, we had to take into account in the hoop stress the effect of thermal stresses. We disregarded it uh, at that time, but now we're including it. We're including it because a lower temperature is going to lower the breakdown pressure, which is going to mean that our fracture gradient is going to be lower as we use uh, a cooler and cooler uh, mud. In some locations, uh, this is uh, something that uh, you cannot avoid. Uh, for example, if you are using uh, mud which is on a pit at very low temperatures, let's say you know somewhere around Siberia, and uh, if you're injecting that uh, mud into the subsurface, it's going to be very likely that as the wellbore reaches the location, the subsurface that you're drilling, the, the mud is going to still be cooler than the formation, and that's going to add this tensile stress. And that's something that you have uh, to take into account. Another condition that happens sometimes is that you might have drilled the wellbore successfully, and after that, you want to lower a logging tool in order to, for example, do a formation image of the wellbore. Well, some of these tools, particularly the ones that use piezoelectric transducers, uh, like sonic tools, they do not resist high temperature. And therefore, in order to run that tool, you might have to use a, a wellbore mat with a lower temperature than the one you use for drilling. So sometimes just because of changing the temperature of the mud, you may turn what was a stable open hole wellbore into something which is uh, unstable. And that's why you have to consider this uh, hoop stress, additional hoop stress uh, due to the case of uh, changes of temperature. Another condition that happens in wellbores is the instability of shale due to chemoelectrical effects. Whenever you are drilling a shale, this is something that you might have to consider. Shales, as you may know, are made of clay and uh, minor amounts of silt and sand, but mostly clay, and the rock is filled with the fluid. Uh, which in this case is a uh, brine. At a very small scale, uh, mud rocks look something like what I'm going to draw here on the right. They are made up, as we said, out of clay. I'm extending the plot that you see in the middle. Let's see, these are two clay platelets, platelets. Because of the mineral configuration of these platelets, they are negatively charged on the surface for typical conditions of uh, pH and salinity. And because they are negatively charged, they are going to attract positive charges. In between the clay, we have uh, platelets. In between the clay, we have water molecules, which fill the space between the clay. And let me draw here uh, a water molecule. A water molecule is going to be considered by oxygen and hydrogen. Actually, water molecules look a lot like Mickey Mouse heads, where the ears are the hydrogens, and the and the, the head, the main 
it is the oxygen and these water molecules when they are mixed with with salts they uh, let me draw this the salts with green they are going to attract these ions and, and cations such that the cations for example here uh, sodium they are going to be closer to the surface of the charged surfaces of the clay so let me make the the cations here of of sodium to be green and let's say the the anions to be in uh, let me do it a little bit smaller in red uh, so these anions are going to be closer to to the hydrogen and all of this is going to compose what is known as a dispersed uh, ion cloud and the distance of this cloud the distance d is going to depend on the amount of salinity that i have in the water that mixes up uh, that makes up this space and in general what we see is that the higher the salinity the higher the amount of these cations the more easily you can neutralize this charged surface and therefore the lower the distance between the platelets is going to be so in a scenario of high salinity it will be somewhere over here on the left where i have high salinity and the equilibrium distance d tends to be small as the amount of cations and anions decreases that means lower salinity the equilibrium distance tends to be bigger and this is very important because this is going to be the basic uh, building of a shale and that means that if you alter the salinity of the water in the shale you're going to alter this equilibrium distance within the shale itself if we have a shale that was originally composed by clays and and brine at a relatively high salinity if you drill that shale with fresh water the fresh water is going to take some of that salt away from the from the shale is going to freshen the water inside the shale and it's going to result on a bigger equilibrium distance between the two clay platelets and that's going to mean that there is going to be a swelling of the shale to you to freshening of the pore water and here we have one example uh, here you have a shale uh, which is in, in dry conditions and when it gets exposed to fresh water this is what you see you see an expansion of the shale you see the swelling of the shale going into something that doesn't look as a rock at all he, he has lost all his cementation all this strength because it was swollen by the fresh water again the uptake of the fresh water is going to lower the salinity so we're going to go into direction from right to left in this plot and that's going to cause an expansion of the shale whenever you're drilling with a mud that has uh, either a uh, very low salinity or almost no salts at all all right so in order to prevent uh, this type of, of failure what uh, what we do is uh, in in order to uh, for example to not to go here from brine salinity from high brine salinity to low brine salinity what you can use is a high salinity mud which is going to prevent that uh, expansion if you from the very beginning use a high salinity brine then um, you're going to inhibit that swelling of the clay 
Uh, well, that has some issues because at uh, with a high salinity map, uh, you are bringing issues of uh, corrosion, or sometimes it might be expensive to to mix your your uh, water-based map with uh, with salts. So it's a solution, but it's just one of the possible solutions. Another solution for shells would be uh, to drill under under balance uh, conditions. Let me summarize this here on the on the right. They are written in my notes, but it's always useful to summarize information uh, with this type of uh, of uh, diagrams. So first solution we said uh, salinity, high salinity map. That is going to uh, prevent the swelling of the clay. Sometimes this is used with uh, potassium iodide salts. Those are very effective uh, inhibitors of shale swelling. Another solution could be also using a water-based map could be to use underbalanced drilling. Do you remember what this was? Underbalanced drilling was drilling performed with the pressure in the wellbore, which is lower than the pore pressure. When that, when you're doing that, what you're doing is you're, you have a gradient of pressure from the formation into the wellbore. So you're virtually producing fluids out of the formation. If this is a shale, then, uh, and it is a continuous interval, the production of water is going to be likely very small. And if that production is very small, that's not going to affect your low circulation, or it's not going to affect the composition of your map. So that could be a good solution uh, as well, because the water in the water-based map is not getting into the formation. It's not uh, swelling the shale. And these are good solutions for water-based mats. Another solution would be to use a, a drilling map which does not mix with the ions in the brine of the shale. And that solution would be to use another type of fluid, which is an oil-based mud. Water is unique because it breaks salt ions into uh, anions and cations very easily. For example, in this example, sodium and chlorine. Uh, and that's what freshens the water. On the other hand, if we had a nonpolar fluid making up a, a mud, such as an all based mud, uh, we could avoid the problem of uh, freshening the water because the oil is not going to interact with that water. It's just not going to alter the salinity of the brine in the wellbore at all. So that's another possible solution that we have in order to prevent this issue of uh, wellbore uh, instability. And I have uh, one more example to show about uh, the effect of wellbore uh, instability and, and clay swelling. I have a nice video to show in order to have something a little bit more realistic than my schematic about clay and water with dissolved ions. This is a, a video I took uh, from this uh, publication in which we have an example of clay particles. Let me maximize this, which are being uh, dehydrated. And you can see that as time passes by, uh, we see the clay platelets that get reorganized and in blue you have the water molecules these are just the oxygen atoms of the water molecules and you can see again as, as time passes by that the distance between the platelets gets closer and closer so this will be an example a similar example to what we were saying before of a change of salinity in the brine uh, in between the platelets of the of clay that we could go from a configuration of high salinity and small spacing as what we see right now. And if we were to freshen the water, the effect is going to be that the distance, equilibrium distance between the platelets is going to get 
uh, bigger and bigger. And let me run this. Hmm. It doesn't run backwards. Uh, OK, just let me then jump at different times. So I hope, I hope you get here the, the idea about the spacing between particles in, in a more realistic uh, with a more realistic simulation. Actually, this is a molecular dynamics uh, simulation. OK, um, so OK, now this is what I wanted to explain. Small spacing, if we were to increase um, lower the salinity, it will go into higher spacing and so on. And this effect, it will result in swelling, and is what we see as a result in this image. All right, let's go to the next topic. And the next topic is about uh, leak of effects. We have assumed so far that we always have a perfect boundary between the drilling map and the formation. And we assume that this stabilizing effective stress radial support is given by the difference between the wellbore pressure and the pore pressure. And we're able to do that because we're assuming that there is what is called a mud cake or, or a filter cake that develops at the wall of the wellbore and results in a sharp gradient going from the wellbore pressure to the pore pressure. And it's, it is this pressure the one that we assume that acts more or less as an impermeable uh, membrane that allows us to compute this effective stress radial support. However, if we have a gradient, we're going to have flow. And if we have flow, we, have, we might have some of these particles eventually to flow further into the formation and to have this filter cake with time to be not that effective. And this is going to be the result, is some of those fine particles that make, that make the filter cake, they move into the formation. This gradient is going to get less and less sharp uh, with time. And as a result, the effective, stradial, effective stress radial support sigma RR at the wall of the wellbore is going to be smaller and smaller. If I have a lower effective stress radial support, that's going to convert and going as sigma 3 in the equation for shear failure, is going to mean that I'm going to have a weaker rock as I have a lower minimum principal stress. And if, if I have a weaker rock, that means that that wellbore is going to be more susceptible to have breakouts. So in this condition, as time passes by, we could go from a wellbore which is perfectly stable with con uh, breakouts under control because I have a nice effective stress radial support. If I leave that uh, wellbore open for a very long time, that I might lose that mud cake. And if that uh, mud cake is lost, that radial stress support is going to be lost. And that strengthening effect of the minimum principal stress is going to be lost and therefore I might have bigger breakouts that might be out of control and that will result also in a problem of wellbore uh, instability. So in summary, your mud cake should, you should try to keep your mud cakes uh, good at, at all times or sometimes if it's uh, very difficult to keep that drilling mud, uh, the, the mud cake in a good condition, then you have to drill fast and, uh, and case your wellbores fast so that you do not let a long time uh, pass by so you lose your mud cake. 